Hello, I'm Eugene Chausovsky, a senior Eurasia analyst at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, our premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. The thing that's really infuriating about the Cubans for me is that they're so really good. They, pound for pound, are more disciplined, have better tradecraft, more effective than KGB ever was. Welcome to the Stratfor Podcast. I'm Faisal Pervez. What does it take to spot a spy? We hear a lot about how corporate America and governments are vulnerable to intrusion, even from their own employees. But what does a spy look like, and how can he or she be caught? James Olson has a new book that serves as a guide to identifying spies. In To Catch a Spy, the former chief of the CIA's counterintelligence calls on the U.S. to do a better job of stopping threats from Chinese, Russian, and Cuban spy services. He shares some of his own spy secrets with Stratford Chief Security Officer Fred Burton. Hi, I'm Fred Burton here today with James M. Olson, who has written To Catch a Spy, The Art of Counterintelligence. The book was published by Georgetown University Press. Jim, thank you for being on Stratford Talks today. You're most welcome, Fred. Nice to be here. Jim, uh, for our listeners that, that may not know, you spent a career in the Directorate of Operations for the CIA. And you were actually the chief of counterintelligence at the CIA and now teach at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. When you look back over your career, how do you think the counterintelligence world has evolved from the time that you first went into the service? That's an excellent question, Fred, because the evolution has been dramatic. I came into the CIA when James Angleton was still reigning supreme. And I believe that Angleton did a great disservice to counterintelligence. I think he ruined our Soviet operations program by chasing conspiracy theories and ghosts. I think he amputated the effective counterintelligence that we should have been doing. And when he left in 1974, it took a long time for us to kind of rehabilitate counterintelligence, to restore it as a discipline that would attract the best people. And even when I went into it, that reputation was lingering. And so Ted Price and I, when we established the Counterintelligence Center, had a big job ahead of us to kind of overcome that that lingering legacy that Angleton had produced, that counterintelligence is a ineffective method of chasing spies. You have a very powerful quote in your book, if you control counterintelligence, you control the service, and that's attributed to James Jesus Angleton. What do you mean by that? I think what we mean by that is that counterintelligence is the heart, it's the core of any intelligence organization. Counterintelligence specialists are able to stop operations that have problems with them. They're able to identify people whose loyalty is in question. So it's a very, very powerful center of running an organization. And Angleton understood that. He took full advantage of it. And he definitely became a despot in in running the CIA because of his control of counterintelligence. It cannot be misused. And that was the problem with Angleton. So we have to be very careful that counterintelligence is applied properly and is in good, reasonable hands today. Did you ever have an opportunity to meet Angleton, Jim? I did. It was a memorable count encounter. It was when I was a very junior officer. I was doing an interim assignment with the counterintelligence staff that Angleton was running. I didn't know any better, so I agreed to take an interim assignment there. And it was interesting uh, because I was doing a, an update study of the Rota Capella, which you know was the World War II Russian spy network in German-occupied Europe. Right. We were getting decrypted messages that NSA was finally breaking all those 25 years later about what the Russian networks looked like. So my job was to take those deciphered messages and to incorporate them into an updated study of the Rota Capella. When I did that, I was rewarded, I thought, with an interview with the man himself. 
And I fully expected, this was funny, I fully expected to get some kind of accommodation or maybe <laughs> a lot of promotion because I, I had worked hard. I thought he'd done a pretty good job. So I went into Angleton's office. It was a darkened room, no kidding. Big black curtains, smoke filled because he was a chain smoker. And my job was to brief him. And I did that and he ripped everything I said apart. Oh, wow. He just absolutely excoriated this this terrified junior officer. <laughs> and he said, didn't I realize that Leopold Trepler and the Rota Capella were German controlled from the beginning, was all disinformation. And even as a junior officer, Fred, I realized this great mind, this so-called counterintelligence genius has gone off the deep end. He's making no sense. So it's kind of uh, interesting when I reflect back on that, when I left that meeting thinking my career was over, and how, <laughs> could, how could you survive being dressed down by the most powerful man in the CIA, James Jesus Angleton. I remember vowing to myself, if my career somehow survives, and I doubt that it will, I don't know what direction it'll take, but I knew, do know one thing, I will never, ever again go anywhere near counterintelligence. <laughs> It's really ironic. It became my first love in this business. <laughs> and you end up being the chief of counterintelligence. Yes, indeed. As I was going through your book, uh, you have these uh, case studies, and it dawned on me to ask you this question. Uh, everybody knows that the Chinese have a very good intelligence service, and, and certainly the Russians, but what are some of the overlooked spy services that probably folks that will be listening to this won't think about that's out there that are always attacking the United States in some capacity? I think the service that's most overlooked is Cuba. And as you saw in the book, I spend a lot of time on Cuba. It's been a very personal vendetta for me to work against Castro and Cuban intelligence. I think they're very effective. They're very well trained. They're very well led. When Castro died, I had hoped that communism would collapse and the archives would be open and we'd be flooded with defectors from the Cuban intelligence service. It didn't happen. And in fact, their level of operations today are very high. We've seen how pernicious they can be in the fact that they are bombarding our people with these mysterious radio waves. And they're also running some very dangerous operations, some very damaging operations in the United States. Kendall Myers wasn't all that long ago, penetration of the State Department. Adam Montez, not all that long ago, penetration of DIA. The thing that's really infuriating about the Cubans for me is that they're so really good. They're very, very effective. I think that they, pound for pound, are more disciplined, have better tradecraft, more effective than the KGB ever was. That's an amazing uh, statement. What would be your evaluation, looking back, Jim, of the East German Stasi? Maybe the best of the best. Really? You know, in my book, I was asked to kind of rank the intelligence services that I worked with or against in my career. I didn't hesitate to rank the Stasi number one. Their professionalism, their impermeability to, to penetration, their leadership uh, with Marcus Wolf, absolutely the best I've ever seen. And when they collapsed after 1989, we got access to their archives. We were blown away, Fred, by the breadth of their operations, the sophistication of their operations, the effectiveness of their operations. Uh, they were really, really good. Uh, number two, I would probably rank the, the Cuban DGI at that time. And then you've got some other really good services. The Chinese today, I think, are the most pervasive and the most uh, efficient in stealing our secrets. But the Russians haven't gone away either. So we've got plenty of threats. You can't overlook the Iranians can't overlook some of these other services like the North Koreans, but the development of their intelligence services is not a par with the, the main adversaries that I think we're facing. China, number one, no question. Russia, number two, and I would put rank Cuba, number three. When you think about your time in dealing with the Russians, have you seen any difference between uh, the old KGB and, and the current SVR, Jim? I think the current SVR is probably better than the old KGB was. I think that they have weeded out some of the old hacks. I think that they have well-educated a younger officer, Cornell. And of course, they are being directed directly from the president's office. Vladimir Putin has not let go of the reins. And he is a very, very good spy master. Uh, 
I remember working against him when he was still a, a lieutenant colonel in the KGB in East Germany. We knew already how good he was, but also how ruthless he was. And he's even more dangerous today than he was then. Yeah, I think they're probably better now. They're more focused. And we know that the level of their operations in the United States hasn't diminished from the height of the Cold War. Putin's obsessed with America, and he is running operations here uh, very aggressively. Still includes things like political reporting, military reporting, but like the Chinese, they are really after our technology. They've discovered that it is a lot faster, a lot cheaper to steal U.S. military type technology than to do the R&D themselves. We'll get back to Fred Burton and James Olson in just a moment. James Olson points out that counterintelligence is not a game of chance, but a profession that takes planning, skill, and the ability to interpret and act on fast-changing developments. Stratfor can help you interpret the significance of today's global events so you can develop a more accurate view of the future for yourself and your business. You can learn more at worldview.stratfor.com. Let's go back to Fred and James. Jim, when you look at uh, the CIA in general or U.S. intelligence, I mean, we have not been immune to spies. I know we had the Clayton Lone Tree case uh, in Moscow, which you cover in your book, and certainly we had Audra James. And paint a picture for our listeners as to what kind of chaos that causes inside the intelligence community. Well, particularly the Ames case and, to a lesser extent, the Howard case and some of the others, uh, Nicholson more recently, which I also cover in the book, ripped us apart, absolutely destroyed our our effectiveness as an intelligence service against the, the Russians. Those cases were devastating. Uh, the worst days in my career when, were when we uncovered Ames, when we uncovered Howard, when we uncovered Nicholson. Those, those cases were beyond any kind of measurement to, to tell you how, how they hurt us, how they damaged us. And of course, it's very demoralizing to realize that people we knew, people I knew, people I trusted, people I worked with could betray us for the basis of motives, money. And what lessons did you learn, for example, from the Audra James case to help identify future spies? I think the Ames case is the perfect case study in how we need to do a better job of counterintelligence. In the first place, as I point out in the book, we need to do a better job of hiring. We need to do a better job of screening potential employees. Rick Ames should never have been hired. He was hired, I think, in large part because his father had been a CI officer, and there was definitely some nepotism at play there, and that should never happen. We certainly shouldn't disqualify people who have family antecedents in their organization, but that's not a basis for getting in in its own right. Once they're on the job, our employees need to be screened more closely. Rick Ames was a train wreck, his personal life, his professional life. He should have been fired many times before. The problem there was that we have this syndrome, which I think is very unfortunate in counterintelligence terms of not ratting out a colleague. So even though many of us, and I'm ashamed to say myself included, saw the flaws that Rick Ames demonstrated in his personal life and his professional life, didn't go forward. He just didn't do that. That was countercultural. Close-knit organizations do not often denounce one of their own. And that's a shame because the best counterintelligence is in the workplace. And we need people who see these anomalies to come forward and report, hey, something's not quite right with this person. You ought, you ought to take a look at it. They're spending too much money. Their attitude has changed. They're doing things on the job that are a little bit questionable. We need to stop those things before they can really uh, come to fruition. The other thing we have to do is to take decisive action and fire people that don't measure up. And we've been too slow to do that. One of your lines in your book as a recommendation, which... Uh, I'm I'm old school, too, when it comes to that, Jim. You say, uh, don't coddle problem employees. That's right. Yeah, we've got to have really good supervision. We've got to have more counterintelligence awareness in the workforce. And at the front end, you know, all these cases that we look at, whether it's Howard, whether it's Anna Montez, any of the other really damaging cases, there were signs in the hiring process 
it should have deterred us from making offers. So I immodestly in my book, as you probably saw, kind of have a an axiom that I think we should use in screening employees for, for hiring future employees. And that is when in doubt, keep them out. Right. We're, we're giving too many waivers for behaviors that should not be acceptable to us. I think we're becoming too lenient in the kind of people we, we let in. And I don't think our background checks or, or psychological assessments are anywhere near thorough, thorough enough. What was it like, Jim, in the height of the Cold War to work behind the Iron Curtain? It was great. <laughs> it's, the, it's the height of our business, Fred, to, to work. Uh, you've worked in dangerous places. You know what I'm talking about. Those of us who go into these careers want to be where the action is. We want to be on the front lines. And for my service, serving in Moscow at the height of the Cold War was a dream come true. It was stressful. It was tough. But you went home really feeling good about what you were doing. Stealing Russian secrets on their territory under their noses is as good as it gets. And <laughs> I, I will never forget the exhilaration I felt when we were able to do that. Looking over your career, what's one of the funniest things that uh, surfaced, whether it be out in the field or from a headquarters perspective? Uh, what's a good story you have that uh, you look back on and you can only laugh today? Well, it was pretty serious business. Let me think about that just for a second. Well, I remember once when we needed someone to go out in disguise as a woman, a male, and so we dressed this person up as a woman, and we all kind of stepped back and took a look at her and realized this is not working. <laughs> Anybody is going to uh, fall for this disguise, so we scratched the operation and had a good laugh over it. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh the spy dust. Jim, did that happen on your watch? Uh, what what exactly is spy dust? It happened on my watch and it was scary. I remember when we had a source in Moscow from the 7th Directorate, he told us that the Russians were using a chemical formula against our officers to track them. And so we began to take uh, swabs because it was invisible, undetectable. And as we swabbed our apartments, our cars, we were absolutely amazed at, at the extent of it. My wife Meredith and my apartment in Moscow was doused in spy dust, this colorless, invisible chemical. It was used to track us. So we had it on our hands. We had it on our shoes. We had it on our clothing. And the purpose, of course, was the KGB then would would screen with ultraviolet light because this fluoresce, these chemicals fluoresce. The offices of their key intelligence organizations and foreign ministry, defense ministry, and looking for any signs of the spy dust. And if they saw the spy dust, they knew that the person at that desk or with access to that office had been in touch with a known or suspected CI officer. That was their rationale. And from a counterintelligence sense, it probably was a, a smart thing to do. The problem was when we sent the, sent the swabs back to Washington for review, and I was, I was back at headquarters when those reviews were completed, it turned out, according to our chemists and our medical professionals, that the spy dust formulas that they were using were highly carcinogenic. Wow. And that was scary. I remember going up to Bill Casey's office when he was the, when he was the director and told him, the Russians were using chemicals that were affecting not only the health of our officers, and but also their families, including their children. He was outraged and demanded action. But the Russians continued for quite some time. So we were all under medical monitoring, and it was nasty. But I think it was typical. The Russians didn't care. As you know, Fred, they were also bombarding us with microwave radiation. Sure. There were some health hazards to serving in, in Moscow during those hateful years. And when you think of that in context with uh, these sonic wave attacks that are now being brought forth in the public, and I know 60 Minutes just did a big story on it, what, what's your thoughts as to what that is and perhaps the actors that are behind it? Well, clearly the actors have to be the intelligence services. And as you've seen, it's shown up now in Beijing as well as in Havana. 
I think our experts are still puzzled as to what the technical purpose is, if there is a technical purpose. Are they energizing listening devices? Are they trying to jam any signals that we might be transmitting? What's their purpose? It has defied our analysis so far. I think it's possible, and I make this point in To Catch a Spy, that on the part of the Cubans, that it is doing exactly what they intended to do, and that is harming the health of our people. And that's very hateful, and that's vicious. But I wouldn't put that past the Cuban intelligence service that I grew to know and to hate in my many years working against them. When you look at the future of an organization like the CIA, where do you see the CIA 20 years from now? CI 20 years from now is going to be a robust, uh, essential, absolutely essential organization. I know for a fact that the world is not suddenly going to get safe for America. The threats that we face are long term. Just the Chinese threat for itself is, is, is number one and will be there forever. So we need good intelligence. I think our leadership will recognize that and will give us the resources we need. So I think the CIA in 20 years is going to be healthy. I think technology will have revolutionized even beyond what it's done so far and how we conduct our operations. I think that our ability to see things from the sky, our ability to intercept communications, anything electronic, and our ability to conduct human operations will be at the top of our game. And I would like to make the point that there will never be a substitute for human spies, human penetration. A technology is not going to put us out of business. There's no substitute for someone at the heart of the target company or organization who can tell you what the intentions are and what the uh, latest actions are. So human intelligence, human as we call it, is here for the long haul as well. Very well said, Jim Olson. Thank you so much for being on Stratfor Talks today. Uh, Jim's book is To Catch a Spy, The Art of Counterintelligence, and it's published by Georgetown University Press. Well, thank you very much, Fred. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for joining us for today's Pen and Sword podcast with former CIA counterintelligence chief James Olson and Fred Burton. We'll have details about To Catch a Spy, as well as links to Stratford Cyber Analysis in our show notes. If you're interested in learning how Stratford can partner with you to keep ahead of global geopolitical developments, be sure to visit stratford.com slash enterprise. Please leave a review on the podcast page in iTunes or wherever you listen. For more geopolitical intelligence and links to our content, follow us on Twitter at Stratford. I'm Faisal Pervez. Thanks for listening.